good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for coming to this talk about snake bite. I think it's a very important topic and I thank Mandy and Tim for um, being here and for setting this up. Uh, I think it's one of the things that um, we might not be paying enough attention to, um, you know, in the medical and, uh, and other um, related uh, schools because it's actually a very, very important subject you know people sort of write it off quickly but if you really think about snake bite it's been uh declared by the who as a neglected tropical disease there's about twenty thousand people in africa that die every year from snake bite uh there is about one hundred twenty thousand people that uh, die ac across the globe from snake bite every year and that's only you know sort of what we know of and on top of that there's a lot of uh, morbidity that also comes with it especially people you know manual laborers that get bitten on their legs get bitten on their hands and then they 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 suffer deformity from it and so it's actually a very important topic and the other thing is it is not something that you can just assume because you you've got general knowledge you'll be able to do it well it's actually a condition that uh, requires some, some specific knowledge and there's, there's pitfalls uh, that you should be aware of. Um, and so with that background, I'm going to jump in and sort of give you a little bit of an overview of uh, the hospital management and particularly the emergency department management of snake bite. And, uh, you know, I think... I'll mention it again later. One of the best ways to learn how to manage snake bite is actually also not necessarily through talks like this, but by practicing it on a mannequin. You know, that's so that, that's that's a, that's a, that's also a good way to learn how to deal with snake bite scenarios. But I will go through a couple of snake bite scenarios just to get you a, give you a feel for feel of it. So the outline of this talk is going to talk a little bit about evidence that evidence, I'll just say more or less about uh, pre-treatment prior to antivenom and a little bit about the observational studies. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of the syndromic approach uh, and if there's any value to actually trying to identify the snake. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about antivenom administration, some other drugs that can be used, and then we're going to go through a case study or two, maybe say something about venom ophthalmia, uh, something about obser uh, water observations of snakes and then uh, just a word or two on the long-term effects of snake bite as well. So this is a slide is just showing you the levels of evidence and as you know in snake bite a lot of it is not very high level of evidence. It's unfortunately you know um, a little bit more, yeah, the, you know, the level of observational studies and expert uh, uh, advice, and that makes it a little bit tricky, you know, because it's not a very reliable level of evidence. But these first um, couple of slides that I'm going to show you um, actually deals with some pretty good evidence on a specific aspect of the management of snake bites. So at least that is something useful to go through. Um, so here is... Uh, a study that was done in Sri Lanka and it really looked at whether and this this one and the next one is going to be on the topic of whether it is of any value to um, give any pre-treatment prior to antivenom administration so let me just um, explain that a little bit uh, most of the antivenoms that we use in developing countries are polyvalent antivenoms. And because they are polyvalent antivenoms, they are usually horse serums. And they are often uh, quite allergenic because of that. Uh, in other countries, like in the US, they use purified antivenoms in the sense that if you think about the antibody, which got the FC component and the FAB component. The FAB component is that little fork. So they, they tend to cut the FC component off and then they use that FAB component. Um, and those antivenoms are less allergenic and they are um, 
they 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 cause less problems from that from that point of view. They've got other problems in the sense that they get excreted quite quickly, and you have to give repeated doses. But at least from the point of view of the of the allergic reactions, they don't cause as much trouble. Um, but these uh, antivenoms that we're dealing with here in South Africa, many other parts of Africa, where there's also different types of polyvalent antivenoms, even monovalent or maybe triple valent or bivalent antivenoms, they are quite um, quite prone to cause allergic reactions. So the question then becomes, what can we do to prevent it? And this study looked at using hydrocortisone, and it found that the hydrocortisone was not effective in preventing allergic reactions when you give the antivenom. Um, so I just want to, I'll, I'll, I'll just show you the next one too. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a nice study. And it looked at adrenaline, antihistamine, and hydrocortisone compared these drugs. And it found that both um, cortisone and um, antihistamines don't work when you give them to try to prevent allergic reactions from administration of antibiotics. <laughs> so uh, what the study found, and it was a big study, it's about a thousand patients. You can see it's about 750 of two of, uh, 752 of them had allergic reactions, which means about 75% of all the patients had allergic reactions. Uh, so it's quite a high percentage uh, of allergic reactions. Uh, our observational studies have shown that our South African polyvalent antivenom give about 48% uh, allergic reactions, of which about 20% is anaphylaxis. So it's slightly less than this antivenom. But what I found with this antivenom is that adrenaline was very effective to prevent allergic reactions. And they used a subcutaneous dosage of adrenaline of 0.25 milligrams. So the moral of the story of these two studies is that, you know, there is an effective way to prevent allergic reactions from antivenom administration. And that is by giving, you know, 0.25 milligrams of adrenaline subcutaneously. So that's something that we should all incorporate into all of our snake bite protocols. Is that if we are going to give antivenom to the patient, we should always give the patient a pre-dose of adrenaline of 0.25 milligrams. And it is subcutaneously, not intramuscularly. And we should not be giving steroids or antihistamines to try to prevent an, you know, an anaphylactic reaction. It's it's a little bit like remember, I don't know, those of you who remember in the old days when we gave streptokinase, we'd also prep the patient by giving them steroids and give them an uh, um, you know antihistamines, but it doesn't work with antivenom. The only thing that works is, is, a, is a precursor dose of, of adrenaline. The only caution is that uh, you shouldn't give it to patients, obviously, that's already having severe hypertension or is already prone to cardiac arrhythmias. Maybe somebody that's got, uh, you know, some uh, tendency to get arrhythmias. In those cases, it should be avoided. But for all your other patients, just prior to giving your um, running your antivenom in, you should be giving them this. 0.25 milligrams of, of adrenaline. And I just want to point out, this is not the treatment of anaphylaxis. If, the, if a patient develops anaphylaxis, we're going to treat them with intramuscular adrenaline. We'll follow it up with, with cortisones and with, with antihistamines. What I'm talking about here is the, the prevention. Um, the next slide is uh, just leading into what when I'm going to talk a little bit about the syndromatic approach. So these two studies, but particularly this one from Roger Blaylock, is a well-known study. It's one of the observational studies that a lot of our local um, protocols is based on. And it was done in Nishawi Hostel on about 300 patients. And it sort of showed us the, it was an observational study that showed us the epidemiology of snake bite in South Africa, which is the epidemiology that we would typically get in other parts of the world as well. Uh, in that snake bites usually occur in summer, uh, it occurs, um, the bites often occur during uh, daytime with, 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 with most snakes, but with some snakes at, at night. Uh, children are bitten more often than, than adults. Um, the, the bites in children are more severe than adults. Uh, it showed that very few patients developed compartment syndrome. 
Um, and one of the things that came out of this study was that, you know, patients can't actually identify snakes very well. So what they did is they had a big chart of snakes and then the patient would come in with a snake bite and they would ask the patient, okay, point to us which snake bit you. And then the patient would, for example, have a puff feather bite, but the patient would point to something like uh, some other like non-venomous snake or the, the patient would have a, you know, a neurotoxic bite and they would point to a mole snake or something like that. And, and from this study, you know, the idea that a patient could identify the snake uh, was sort of abandoned because it was shown that it, it's not effective. And then Blaylock came up with the syndromic approach to snake bite, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. Um, and it also gave the whole idea of trying to identify the snake a bit of a bad name, but I'll try, I'll get back to it a little bit later because I feel that one must, one must not, just because patients can't identify snakes doesn't mean people like a pathologist and, you know, doctors with interest in snake bite can't identify snakes. So one must just get that whole idea a little bit clear in your own head. Uh, and then it helps, uh, it will help you a little bit in, in your, your decision making. So based on uh, the study, uh, Roger Blaylock then published this idea of the syndromic approach to snake bite in the SA family practice in 2005, and you identified those three syndromes that we're all quite familiar with. Uh, for those of you who are maybe less familiar with snake bite, this would be an important slide in the sense that, you know, the clinical syndromes are important to know. The first one is painful progressive swelling. The second one is progressive weakness. And the third one is bleeding. The idea of a syndromic approach is that if a person arrives in your emergency department with a snake bite, uh, you would use the clinical picture of the patient and the clinical syndrome the patient develops uh, to decide how to manage the patient. And it's been shown to be a very effective way of managing patients. So, for example, if a patient develops a painful progressive swelling or where the person develops, you know, swelling of a limb that progresses quite fast, develop blisters and so on, you'd be able to assume that this person was bitten by something like a puff adder. And based on that, you can give uh, antivenom. Obviously, you must know, you must be able to differentiate, let's say, a puff adder bite from something like a stiletto bite or some other snake bite where the swelling is not that, that fast. Uh, and they found in these observational studies that with puff adder, it's usually the, the swelling is about five to to seven centimeters per hour. So if you see the swelling progressing at five to seven centimeters per hour, then without knowing, without seeing the puff adder, you can know that the person was bitten by a puff adder and you can give antivenom. If there is swelling, but it's very, very, very slow, like it's just like maybe a centimeter or two every hour, or maybe something like that, you would you'd, you'd know the patient was bitten by a venomous snake, but, but not necessarily by one that needs antivenom. And then any neurological symptoms, that's the next syndrome, progressive weakness, any neurological symptoms would qualify the patient for a um, antivenom. So the person developed problems in swallowing, slurred speech, you know, we talk about the P's and S's, uh, the P's are pupil dilatation, paralysis, paresthesia around the mouth, ptosis, meaning the, the eyelids are drooping, and the ACEs are things like swallowing, difficulty in swallowing, um, sweating, uh, salivation. Um, those things would all be the progressive weakness symptoms, and the, those patients would all require antivenom. And then the last one was is the bleeding. So patients who are bitten by a bone slung start developing big bruises, bleeding from the gums, bleeding from the nose, those kind of things. Those patients would require antivenom too. So um, that was the, the, the whole approach of the syndromic approach. And it's something that's been integrated into most of the snake bite uh, guidelines and protocols. And that's like a standard, something that you have to know about snake bite is, is understanding these syndromes. But it's not as simple as that. There's, 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 there's more detail to it because, and, and I'll talk about that when I talk about snake identification a little bit. 
Okay, so this other study was also observational study by Daryl Woods, and it confirmed a lot of the things that Blaylock found in his uh, study. And uh, one of the interesting things that uh, Woods also found is that very few patients developed any um, signs of a compartment syndrome. And uh, he actually did ultrasound on about 40 of the patients and found that there was almost in none of those cases, there was severe muscle swelling. And so the idea of compartment syndrome in snake bite uh, is not actually very valid. Uh, rarely it, it happens in snakes with very long fangs, for example, gaboon adder, or when the tunica has been applied to the wound for a prolonged period of time. But generally speaking, just a snake bite from a puff adder or, or maybe a Mozambican spitting cobra, it's extremely unusual for it to cause a compartment syndrome. And it's something that we need to advocate for because especially our surgical colleagues have a tendency to, 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 to overdiagnose compartment syndromes and snake bite. And if you cut into, you know, an envenomated limb uh, and uh, it, it actually caused, you know, severe morbidity and those patients suffer for a very long time struggling with those uh, fasciotomy wounds. And actually it's not, it's not necessary to do it. So why, why go and do a fasciotomy when it's not really indicated? And now really, I mean, this one, I'm not going to be able to show you now. I guess I wonder if it will play. I guess it won't play now. Let me see. Justin Schwartz. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. I was at summer camp a few miles from Yosemite and I was bitten by a northern Pacific rattlesnake. I was sitting there um, and had my arms dangling on my side and I was in the middle of a conversation and I felt a sharp pain in my left hand and as I pulled my hand up I saw a snake fall down. I ran over to them and yelled out, I got bit by a snake, I got bit by a snake. The bite was right in the palm of my hand. After all the INDs and the cleaning that they did, the original bite marks uh, from the fangs were never, never visible. I had no idea how severe this was going to be. It was really quite a rescue that took place. They put me on the stretcher, and by the time I got to the trailhead, it was about five hours after the bite, and there was a helicopter waiting for me there. They put me on the helicopter took me to UC Davis. Um, that second helicopter ride was when they started the anti-venom treatment. Uh, I eventually got 30 vials. Um, and so that the, the treatment for that didn't start until like probably around seven or eight hours after the bite, um, which is a really long time. You can see this original scar was from the fasciotomy. Uh, they cut my arm open from here all the way up almost to the shoulder. What we don't do well is apparently a lot of surgeons have this idea that you have to cut because that's what they do for a living. And they still have this idea that fasciotomies are the way to treat snake bite. It's used when they when things look grotesque, but it, it can be used in the event of true compartment syndrome, which from what I've read and what I've seen is fairly rare. You can have grotesque uh, swelling of an extremity without the need for fasciotomy. There are legitimate reasons to do a fasciotomy, but in snake bite, it's extremely rare. I've never seen a snake bite that needed a fasciotomy. I've seen a lot of snake bites. Let's start out by saying it's an area of controversy and uh, that surgical training uh, may be different from, uh, from medical training in this regard. Uh, and then surgeons and, and orthopedists in particular who deal with elevated uh, tissue and uh, compartment pressures under other circumstances have a certain way of responding to that. Now, if you have a crush injury, for example, of an extremity, and you have bleeding and swelling inside the muscle compartment, if you, uh, if you don't release that pressure, you, you get loss of that muscle tissue and loss of that function. And so fasciotomy is the, is the proper management for those cases when you can't reduce intracompartmental pressures um, by conservative means. The traditional surgical training, as far as I can tell, because they can do fasciotomies and the 
bites within a few days look awful. They're often trained to do the fasciotomies, but as antivenom has become increasingly available and as the adage of give sufficient antivenom early enough has been sort of passed through the at least the emergency response community, so the ERs are trained to give plenty and give it early, we're seeing little need, probably no need, that's a bit drastic to say it's never appropriate, but rarely appropriate to do a fasciotomy. The, the use of fasciotomy was not developed for snake bite. Fasciotomy was intended to be used for compartment syndrome that comes when you have uh, an increased pressure in a muscle compartment because of, for example, bleeding. So if you've had uh, a wound that penetrates into the muscle compartment from a stab wound or a, an auto accident or a, a broken bone where it broke just so, and a big rush of high, high pressure blood fills that. So orthopedists who've been trained that after a car accident, a high pressure in the compartment needs to be treated by relieving the pressure, translate that knowledge to a wound where you have swelling and pain and they, without thinking it all the way through, since they don't know snake venom biochemistry, they try to apply the same principle. Okay, I'm going to stop the video there because I think uh, Tim is probably also going to talk about this and I actually want to get to the rest of the stuff uh, before my, I run out of time. So um, that's actually just a good video to watch to just give you an idea about uh, fasciotomy, which is like really something that we should not be doing a lot for snake bites. And I've, I've been, you know, uh, been sent articles uh, from people who've done like a series of 20 fasciotomies on snake bites and it's just like how do you respond to that because this is comp all, all 20 has probably been inappropriate uh, and the treatment of these uh, bitten limbs is actually to, and to treat it conservatively uh, and uh, one should generally speaking um, not to do fasciotomies unless there's a very good reason. You know, maybe the patient had a tunica or maybe it was like a specific snake that bit the person, like a kaboon adder. Um, and, and if you do decide to do a tunica, uh, you know, you should maybe have something more, more objective like, like an ultrasound or solar muscle compartment or, uh, you know, increased pressure. But I th I'm sure Tim will talk about bit more. So what I want to get back to now is just this approach of a patient coming into the emergency department that's been bitten and uh, the fact that we use the syndromic approach to manage these patients. Um, so then the question is, is there any value to identify the snake as well or should we just use the symptoms and are there any bedside tests that we can use? So that really brings us to the fact, you know, this little thing of uh, is there any value? So I want to highlight one or two symptoms, one or two cases. For example, let's say the patient was bitten by a, um, we've recently had a case of a patient that's been bitten by a night adder. Uh, it was a small child and the patient came in and he had very severe uh, swelling of his uh, uh, leg. He had blisters. The swelling was very fast, and um, in that case, by the syndromic by using the syndromic approach, it would have been perfectly in order to administer antivenin to that patient. But because we knew that the snake was a um, night adder, because the snake was identified by a pathologist, obviously not by the patient pointing to a chart, uh, we decided not to give antivenin because we knew that it would expose that patient to additional risk. And the antivenin doesn't really work for um, for the for the for the you know for the for the for the night you know where a patient came in and was bitten by a, a snake that was positively identified as a boom slump and the patient had absolutely no bleeding nothing no symptoms uh, but it takes it's a consumption goggle so it takes about four hours to six hours before the person start developing the syndrome. And in, in, in those cases, one can, if it's a proper bite and, uh, you know, the snake has been identified, you can actually give the anti, you know, you can actually give the, um, the anti-venom early and it will make a difference. Uh, another example would be something like a Berg bite, which would come in with typical neurotoxic. So 
if it's only the neurotoxic symptoms, you'll argue, okay, patient must get anti-venom, but if you had noticed, no, no, it's a bird adder, then you'd, then you'd sort of fulfill the anti-venom. So with that, I'm not saying that we mustn't use the syndromic approach. I say we absolutely must use the syndromic approach, but we must, we can incorporate, um, you know, the, um, we can incorporate the, the, the identifica identification of the snake into it. As well. It has to be somebody that knows the, knows snakes. In other words, you need to know, have a pathologist. Uh, uh, whether the snake must be brought in is, you know, that you know that can cause trouble. Some sometimes people use, you know, they don't use the consent, so they or they kill the snake or something like that. But a picture would be useful. Uh, if the snake is brought in a clear container, rigid container, that can also be useful. Uh, and then you have to have a pathologist that you trust to identify the snake. And that knowledge can actually help to, um, to, 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 to uh, affect how you treat uh, the, the, the case. Anti-venom administration. Okay, so I actually don't have my slide in here about the snakes that uh, that's covered by the polyvalent anti-venom, but I'll just mention it before I talk about anti-venom administration. So we've got a simple one, two, three, four, four rule for uh, all the snakes that are covered by the South African polyvalent anti-venom. So the one is for uh, is for the runcals. There's only one runcals. Then two is for two adders, the puff adder and the gaboon adder. The three is for the three cobras. Uh, those cobras, uh, sorry, the, the three mambas, those those mambas being the black mamba, green mamba, and the Jameson's mamba. And then the four is for the four cobras. And four cobras are the uh, snouted cobra, Cape forest cobra, and Mozambican spitting cobra. So by, by knowing those 10 snakes that are covered by the polyvalent anti-venom, uh, you'll also be able to use uh, that uh, uh, when you make your decision about giving anti-venom. And then worm slug anti-venom is obviously only for the worm slug. So now you get a patient into your emergency department. The patient has got one of the uh, clinical syndromes, the progressive swelling or, or progressive weakness or bleeding. Uh, the first two and you decide you want to give polyvalent and okay yeah you must remember that you should never give polyvalent anti if patient area. So you put the patient in your resuscitation area, you put the patient on monitors, you get a proper eye you have resuscitation equipment ready and you have, you have um, adrenaline ready for in case the patient develops. As we said earlier, you're going to give your uh, pre-dose subcutaneous adrenaline, 0.5 milligram, and then you're going to run your anti-venom. Now, yes, at Apple, we run it in a drip. In Eswatini, they like to give it directly IV. I'm not liking direct methods so much because sometimes you get like an anaphylactoid. So I prefer to put it in a drip. Um, for Sorry, Chris. For, for, Mandy. For Can you swelling. Me? You see, yeah, I've got six to eight vials. That's typical dose for a, for a puff adder bite. And then a gaboon adder, you can go up to 20 vials. But... Um, uh, anti venom gets scared. Uh, for, for, for painful progressive swelling with four vials. Uh, because I find that it's unnecessary to give more than four vials, and people might debate it a little bit. It's important to give less than four vials. It's the absolute minimum for a painful progressive swelling. But I start with four vials. Uh, uh, but it's more to do with being able to treat more bites then it is that, you know, if you can give six to eight vials, then fine. But it's just sometimes that we don't, we do start running out of the, the antivenom. If you have progressive weakness, that's the neurotoxic bites caused by the spitting, uh, non, non spitting cobras or the mambas. Uh, in that case, you have to give your, um, uh, a bigger dose of eight to 12 vials. Uh, and you can actually 
factors. So you can, if there's no response, then you can give every uh, two hours, uh, you can repeat two vials. Now, people are walking around, it says antivenom should not be given. Uh, and they say, you know, why, you know, it's going to be antivenom. If a patient has been bitten by a snake that's not by the antivenom, the antivenom should not be given. But when there is an indication for antivenom, we and in a safe it has to be given. And, and the reason is, you know, let's say for uh, something like a, a mamba bite or a, a bad a snout cobra bite or a, um, something like a Cape Cobra bite. If you're just going to put the person on a ventilator, that person might be ventilator for 10 days, 15 days, 20 days. And I've had multiple cases, uh, and I'll show you just now a mamba bite that we had, where we gave the antivenom early and the patient here. Yeah. Yeah. Dries, your signal yes, is coming and going. We are losing you. Manny, can you still hear me? No, Dries, it's, it's very bad. We are battling to hear you. Keep, keep losing Guys, can signal. you still hear me? Dries, can you hear me? Uh, I'm going to confirm if you can still hear me. Phone Chris, can you hear me? It's Tim. You are breaking up badly. Okay. Hey, uh, can you? You hear me now? No, Dries, we can't. Dries, uh, okay. we can't hear uh, you. I mean, we can uh, hear you, but it's breaking up. I want to if move to in, uh, Tim for come, a bit, and then you can, can come, come back, back in. in. Is that okay? Yeah, All I can right. hear you. Let me, let's start with Tim's lecture, and then we'll Hello? come back in. Okay. Okay. Hi, Tim. Okay, sure. Sorry, Tim. Tim. Yes, I okay. uh, hear you, Mandy, but um, Dries will need to unshare. Uh, okay, Tim, I think we're going to go over to you now, okay? Okay. Dries, could you probably, could you possibly un unshare, please? That's done, that's done. Okay. Can everybody see that? Thank you, Tim. We can see it. I just want to start the stop the recording from Dries because I might want him to do it again again and just start yours. So if you can just give me two seconds. No problem. <laughs> 